webinar. So thanks for taking the time out of your day to join us. We hope this is a fun and educational webinar for all of you. I definitely want to thank, um, we had over 70 people who signed up to join us live today. So thank you so much for wanting to be here with us on your Friday. If you would like to go ahead and add to the chat, click all panelists and attendees and let us know where you're tuning in from, whether that's Chile, Colorado or super sunny California. We're super glad you've decided to spend your lunch break with us today. So go ahead and put in the chat where you're tuning in from. Feel free to include what year you graduated as well. Um, we'd love to see your message come through. My colleague Dakota is also here doing some different things in the chat, sharing some links. So thanks so much, Dakota. And thank you to our members who have chosen to join us today. We sincerely appreciate uh, your membership helping make different engagement opportunities possible for us, especially in this virtual world. It's nice we can still do some different things. So since this is a webinar, you are muted with your camera off, but please utilize the Q&A and the chat feature to ask any questions throughout the presentation. John will have some time um, at the end of the presentation today to address any questions you might have from his content. Uh, Dakota is also going to share in the chat some technology help as well as some virtual engagement resources. Um, so definitely be on the lookout for that. And we'll also put at the very end of the event our survey. So if you liked this event or want to let us know how we're doing, we'd really appreciate if you take take a minute to fill that out for us. Uh, but you're not really here to hear from me. You're here for our awesome guest speaker, John. So I'm excited to introduce John, who studied uh, evolutionary biology at the University of Colorado and horticulture at Colorado State University. He joined CSU Extension after 10 years in public horticulture, committed to education and passionate about gardening. John is driven to improve the quality of life for humans by improving the quality of life for plants. John, I'm so glad you've decided to join us and bring this awesome content to us. Welcome. Thanks. I'm very excited to be here today. And thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us. And we're gonna talk a little bit about plants and how much we love plants as sort of a Valentine's Day special. And this is gonna be different than what you might normally hear from a CSU Extension talk, hopefully, you know about Extension as proud CSU graduates. Um, the Extension is the outreach arm of the university and there are Extension offices in nearly every county in the, uh, in the state and as part of our land grant mission at Colorado State University, Extension is there to reach the citizens of Colorado with the newest advances in science, in agriculture, agriculture horticulture, food safety, finance, you name it, we're there for you. So. Um, there'll be a little bit more about extension uh, generally later in the talk, but very happy to be here. So, plant love. I think um, it's true that humans in general, I think all of us have um, a visceral reaction to plants, a really deep connection. You know, who seeing a view like this wouldn't be intrigued and want to go down that mown path? You know, who isn't wanting to go into the forest and, you know, keeping up with trends these days, maybe do a little forest bathing, sit and watch the flowers, see if any butterflies come by. There's a, maybe a butterfly right here. Can't tell if that's a butterfly or a dead leaf. Um, and this phenomenon has been observed across cultures and uh, across times, really. And uh, quick disclaimer, this talk is going to be somewhat focused on plant love in European culture. Partly that's because that's where the garden writers are and partly that's my background. Um, but know that this relationship is very deep and very human no matter where you are on earth. And it's got its own special term, uh, biophilia, which was coined just in the 60s by Eric Fromm, but enriched by E.O. Wilson in 1984. And uh, it means again, the rich natural pleasure that comes from being surrounded by living organisms. And hopefully that resonates with you immediately. You think, oh yeah, you know, I love being around living organisms, love having things, you know, on me, uh, love that feeling of, is there something on the back of my neck right now? Um, even back to our very most primitive roots of being out in the wilderness. And so of course, this is ridiculous. This is preposterous, right? Look at this. And so when we say biophilia, I'm going to contend that we actually mean phytophilia, which is a word that I made up, and it means I like plants. Um, 
and not to say, you know, sure, we have kitty cats and dogs, but in general, when we say, oh, yes, I love being surrounded by living organisms, what do we mean? We mean plants. And I will contend in this talk that humanity's relationship with plants is in general broader, deeper, and longer than any other intentional relationship with other organisms. And so let's take a look at that. So you may recognize this fellow. Um, this is Itzy, the Iced Man, and he's about 5,300 years old. So over here on your timeline, and you can see the vast number of plant products this guy had on him when he died. From useful and all useful um, items, you know, dagger handles, his bow, he had plant foods and medicines, his cloak was made of grass and linden fibers, he had grass lined boots, he had charcoal wrappers, um, but 5,300 years, you know, that's old, but that's not that old. So let's keep looking. Let's go back to 16,000 years ago, where we have uh, definite evidence um, from a paper published in 2013 of two people buried in a grave covered with flowers. Um, flowers all over the place in here, a very deliberate flower burial. And the really, you know, what's, what's the reason? Is there a practical reason for putting the dead with flowers? I've never been able to think of a practical reason for that. And I think that's evidence, again, of that deep emotional connection that we have. You'll see here 14,000 years ago, that's the best average guess for the domestication of the dog. Just to give you, that's about where we are here. So flowers and dogs, you know, 2,000 years, when is that far a year, that long ago? Yeah, it's probably about the same time, but uh, very deep indeed into our history. And then if you look over here between 60 and 80,000 years ago, there's some tantalizing evidence for flower burials, even going back that far. And, you know, there are some, um, there are some archeologists who like to ruin other people's fun, I suppose, who say, no, 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 that was pack rats, not humans adding flowers to graves. And they may be right, but I say, you know, it was 80,000 years ago, so who's to say what really happened? But know that there's evidence at least that far that maybe we were burying one another with flowers. But let's talk about, you know, beyond just putting flowers on graves, plants do things to us physiologically. And so here's a list taken from a review of all the medical literature just uh, two years ago now. And people around plants, and when I say around plants, I mean casually around plants. These aren't folks that are you know, locked in a biosphere or something. It's people with a house plant, people with a tree in their yard, like the person you see here in this photograph, people who take walks in the park, people with a house plant, see reduced anxiety and stress, uh, smaller waist circumference, increased physical fitness. You can see the list here, improved self-esteem, reduced effect of dementia. All of these things ultimately leading to increased friendliness. And so hopefully, um, if you don't already have a known relationship with plants, I guarantee you, you have a relationship with them, whether you know it or not. Um, hopefully you will decide to deepen your relationship with plants um, if only in the self-interested way of getting some of these benefits, but ultimately to increase the level of friendliness in the world, because who isn't in favor of that? So over the next few minutes, <coughs> um, we're gonna do this in three sections. The first, I'm gonna convince you that plants are everywhere. Perhaps you're already convinced of that, perhaps not, um, but I'm gonna do my best to make sure you know it. Um, second, we're gonna look at some specific examples of plants um, and plants that have uh, particularly special relationships with humans. And then third and last, um, I'll tell you some ways to get some more plants in your life. So if you need ideas, I'll be there for you. So plants are everywhere. And this may seem obvious. So you can see here, all right, yeah, there's a bowl of peas. There's another bowl of peas. There's wood on the house. There's plants in a pot there. But look, oh gosh, they're on the clothes here. The more I looked at this picture, I said, oh my, there are floral motifs on this chair. And then I realized this little person is named after plants. And so what I originally thought was, you know, oh, you know, there are three or four plants in this photograph. They actually, the only things that aren't plants in here are bricks, concrete, and this plastic chair. Everything else in this photograph is plants. And that goes further into our art and architecture. So here, an example of some stained glass, you can see, more plants than not. Again, plants everywhere here. 
Uh, here's a famous hotel in Cincinnati, Art Deco and architectural style. Plants transcend the style, they're everywhere. So we went from uh, Baroque Rococo uh, and stained glass to now Art Deco and you can see just plants all over the place. You got leaves and flowers, you got leaves here, you got plants way up here, even in, oh yeah, those are draperies, but gosh, there are plants up in there too. Down to some of our most iconic buildings. So in addition to having plants like, all oh, right, there's an obvious hedge, there's some trees, like they've got a green roof or something going on up there. But also even on these column capitals, there are plants, there are carved plant leaves between the windows, there are swags that are uh, essentially stone plants. Plants permeate, in addition to our building and our architecture, every aspect of human life from, from birth to death. They permeate our friendships, so much so that you can go to the hardware store around Christmas and for five bucks, you can buy yourself a pre-wrapped, pre-packaged gift kit, an amaryllis kit, um, for example. There are other things too that come in these kits. It's labeled right on it that it's a gift. And uh, these sorts of things are all over the place. Plants as gifts. Uh, they're there in courtship and weddings. You know, here we are at a wedding. You've got a boutonniere, you have a bouquet, you've got a big flower mural. And who hasn't brought flowers with them on a first date? Uh, big life events, you know, oh, look, here's a baby, how wonderful, and what is she wearing on her head? Uh, that's right, it is a flower, whoops, try to go back. Um, there's a flower on her hat right there, um, because we just can't escape plants. They're there for grand events, so here we have sort of an unassuming nine bark, a uh, little shrub needs to be weeded around the base of it. But if you look at this plaque, you'll actually notice that this shrub represents the one millionth tree planted out of a targeted five million trees to mark the diamond of jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II. And uh, so this is in Manitoba in Winnipeg. And uh, the Canadians got the queen herself uh, to plant this shrub along with her husband in 2010. Um, she was, you know, probably mid eighties and dug a hole and planted a tree in order to celebrate this grand event. Um, you know, in this shrub looking at it, it's not that grand, is it? But we have it memorialized with a plaque. We decorate with plants in obvious ways, you know, Halloween jack-o'-lantern time, we got plant decorations everywhere, but in less obvious ways too. So if you look here at this photograph on the right, um, taken in your average home decor store, every one of the pictures on that rack has plants in it, whether they're stylized plants on the top whether they're plants uh, in a more natural, natural aesthetic surrounding the birds. Uh, they're there in our greetings and get well cards. On this rack of cards, uh, sympathy and get well cards, there are 15 cards. 13 out of the 15 feature plants. Uh, the other two have sunsets. And then finally at funerals. And so here's a photograph um, of what has been described as the largest display of dying cut flowers of all time. And you probably recognize it outside of Buckingham Palace um, for Princess Diana's funeral. And so plants really are everywhere and not just in a casual way. They're there for our deepest emotional moments. For some reason, our first instinct is, I need a plant for this. So let's look at a few plants of note, plants with which we have particular relationships. And uh, I've organized this little section. Uh, we're going to have some flowers in the bouquet. We'll talk about dinner and, uh, and then after dinner for um, these plants today. So if you run out of topics <laughs> at a dinner party or at your Valentine's Day event, uh, you'll have some ready items to share. So we'll start with roses. Roses are red or pink or yellow or white, just about any color except for truly blue. You may not know that roses are the national flower of the United States of America, and that's pretty recent. It was declared in 1986, and Colorado can boast the oldest known rose fossil on Earth at about 35 million years old. So if you ever see a, a drawing of a triceratops with a rose, it's inaccurate, but a woolly mammoth with a rose, absolutely. There are a bunch of different kinds of roses, 110 wild species at least, and the number of cultivated varieties and that's typically what you'll see in bouquets or in most gardens. That's numberless, essentially, um, of named and unnamed cultivated varieties of rose. And that's due 100% to human interest in this plant. Um, the fragrance, 
the appearance has captivated human imagination for at least 1500 years, I would say. And so we've done a lot of breeding uh, similar to dogs. So we have roses for every taste. Um, Empress Josephine, the wife of Napoleon, grew every type of rose that was known um, then in the early 1800s. That was 250 varieties in her gardens. The oldest known cultivated rose is on the back of a cathedral in Germany, and it's called the Millennium Rose because it's said to be a thousand years old. It might be a thousand. Um, scientists have determined that it's at least 700. Um, so it's close enough, right? You know, who's what's 300 years for a human lifespan anyway? And the most fascinating thing about that rose, in my opinion, is that it was pretty much bombed to oblivion during World War II and regenerated from the regenerated from its roots. So not only is it 700 years old at least, uh, it's been through a thing or two as well. Most roses that you see with multiple petals like this, that is the result of human intervention. Wild roses have five petals, as you see here, with all of these exposed stamens um, that have nice access for bees to come and pollinate them. Uh, through selective breeding efforts, humans essentially chose mutations of roses that converted a lot of those stamens into petals. And so those cultivated roses with ruffly petals are less good for pollinators, but better for bouquets. And they still do have pollen in most cases. Not every domestic rose um, produces pollen, knockout roses being one notable um, example of one that doesn't. And then you'll hear the phrase, uh, every rose has its thorn. And that's technically not true. Um, and it's not true perhaps for the reason that you're thinking. Um, most roses do have sharp protuberances, but if you will ask a uh, plant morphology purist, they will tell you that they are not in fact thorns, they are prickles. Um, and that has to do with the, the tissues from which those prickles develop. Thorns are actually modified branches, whereas prickles are outgrowths from the, the epidermis, the exterior skin of the rose itself. And so every rose has its prickle, does not have the same, uh, the same sort of ring to it, doesn't have the same flair, but it is probably, at least if you're a, a plant anatomy purist, more accurate. Moving from roses to violets, um, roses are red and violets are blue, and the original violets are bluish purple. Um, the violets that most people talk about, or if you read about violets and their human associations, is uh, viola odorata, or the sweet violet. And it's captivated people partly because it has this fleeting smell. It smells really good. People are always trying to capture it for perfumes. Um, but that smell disappears so quickly. It's, it's almost as though by inhaling the flower once, you use all of the smell and it has to regenerate. What's actually happening is that the uh, ionone that is one of the components in that smell is overwhelming your olfactory system. And essentially, you know how if you're in a room for a while and you think when you first go into the room, this room kind of smells and then you get used to it, that's your brain and your olfactory nerves compensating for that smell. Violets will do that almost immediately to human noses. And so they've got this reputation for fleeting smell, but they're actually uh, anesthetizing your nose in a certain way. Uh, most commonly, we're not gonna see true violets like the one in the picture. We see pansies all the time, right? They're in the garden center now. You'll see them at you know, entrances of neighborhoods because they can cling to life through the winter. And those are hybrids and they were developed uh, supposedly simultaneously and independently by two gardeners for rich lords in England that lived about a half a mile away from one another. Um, I'm not sure how likely I find that story. I suppose it's possible, but I suppose I, you know, I just can't imagine that those two gardeners weren't speaking to one another. And then finally, um, another Napoleonic reference for you, um, Josephine, the same Josephine that grew all those roses at her mansion, um, she had violets growing on her grave, and when Napoleon was sent off to St. Helena after Waterloo for his second exile, he picked violets to take with him from her grave. And I tell you that um, partly because it's an interesting factoid, but mostly because I want to challenge you now to explore the reaction and the feeling that you just had. If I tell you Napoleon picked violets from his wife's grave to take into exile with him, your first reaction was probably not, what a weird thing to do, but something perhaps more like, oh, that is really touching and sweet. Um, 
regardless of your thoughts about Napoleon one way or another, the thought of taking flowers from a grave with you somewhere, something that should tug at you, should tug at your heartstrings a bit, doesn't strike you as weird. That in itself, I think, is evidence of this really deep relationship that humans have made with plants and flowers in particular. Um, moving along from roses and reds to tulips. Um, tulips, I think, are most famous for bulb mania, right? Who hasn't heard of the Dutch and the mania about tulips growing that had yellow and red stripes? The one in the photograph here, not caused by viruses, but caused by plant breeding. And you know, it's, it's almost a cautionary tale, right? That uh, the Dutch got so excited about tulip bulbs and led to this huge economic crash. Um, really, you know, yes, a bubble burst. It didn't crash the economy of the Netherlands. Um, I think it was about 5% of the total economy. So certainly nothing, nothing to, to sneeze at, but um, didn't crash the economy. Shares in the Dutch East India Company continued to rise. Uh, tulips were really the first ornamental plant commodity. And again, that, that bubble burst, it did burst, but it wasn't the economic tragedy that we think of it now. I suspect um, that perhaps we think of it as sort of this cautionary, ridiculous tale, because many of our um, histories about that sort of thing come through the English, thanks to our uh, national heritage, and the English and the Dutch have a favorite rivalry. More evidence for this is the fact that the English did virtually the same thing with hyacinth bulbs, another spring bulb, but nobody ever hears about hyacinth mania and the economic crash that followed it in England. We only ever hear about those silly, silly Dutch and their tulips. Um, I would like to point out that during the bulb mania of the 1630s, there was a young doctor whose last name was Peterson, uh, who decided I'm just gonna change my last name to Tulip because these things seem pretty darn popular. And he was elected the mayor four times. I don't know if that was specifically because of his name change or if he was a pretty good guy also. Um, evidence suggests he had other things going for him because as a point of interest, he also is the first recorded person to propose that tobacco caused lung issues. The last flower we'll talk about in our bouquet before dinner is the chrysanthemum. These you don't normally think about in spring. They're a traditional fall flower, uh, particularly in Japanese culture. There are chrysanthemum festivals, uh, particular ways of growing chrysanthemums, from huge uh, single chrysanthemum flowers on a plant to cascades of chrysanthemums, the thousand chrysanthemum flower with the thousand blooms all flowering at once. Um, but I bring them up in your interesting dinner party, dinner party conversation um, because they mutate pretty easily. One of the traits and characteristic characteristics of this plant that um, mutations happen in its growing stems that cause changes in flower color and morphology. And so in the photograph here, you can see a lovely uh, lilac pink colored chrysanthemum that has a white flower right in the middle. And that's caused by a mutation. That white flower would be called a sport. And this happened fairly regularly with chrysanthemums. But in the 1950s, uh, somebody noticed that um, we could use radiation to increase the number of sports that a particular plant might produce and thereby get new flower colors and new flower shapes more quickly. And so you started getting chrysanthemum plants put inside a lead box with radioactive elements to be exposed to gamma rays, or you had them being uh, x-rayed in order not to see the inside of the plant in that case, because I don't think anything would show up on an x-ray, but rather to induce mutations so that we could get new colors and new forms of chrysanthemums. And that radiation-induced mutation is something that is still used today to try to create new varieties of plants, not only in chrysanthemums, but in other uh, popular horticultural varieties. Moving on to dinner, um, there are so many plants we eat. Um, so I wanna cover just one and that is rosemary. And the reason I want to cover it is because um, of this old, old phrase, rosemary for remembrance. And it was used on graves and at weddings. But interestingly, I think, as woven into crowns for people who were sitting for exams to help your memory. And there've been a number of studies in the past 20 or 30 years that have actually demonstrated that rosemary does help your memory. Um, it improves short-term memory functions in uh, lots of studies, uh, particularly one in 2017. And then in 2003, it was shown to help with context-dependent recall. And essentially what that means 
is uh, if you ask somebody to remember things and then you ask them to remember it in the same place they learned it, um, you have better luck in, if you're in the same place you learned it. That's context-dependent recall. Um, that's behind the advice of things like, oh, you should always try to study in the same place. If you remember back from when you were in college and sitting for exams, study in the same place. It'll help you remember things. Interestingly, the, um, the reason that rosemary may help with context-dependent recall is that most people find that it doesn't smell that great. And so if you can imagine if you were wearing a crown of rosemary, um, that's a pretty pungent reminder, a pungent association for your brain. And it may actually help you remember things. It's been shown scientifically to help you remember things. There are some uh, potential evidence that shows that rosemary tea may help with things like dementia. Um, I'm not sure about those things. I'm not a doctor and I enjoy the smell of rosemary, but know that um, rosemary for remembrance is not just a, a cute saying, but actually has some evidence behind it. Um, rosemary is also one of those things that you can actually grow in most parts of Colorado. You live high up in the mountains, you don't have a chance necessarily, but you know, in Denver, Fort Collins, uh, certainly on the western slope, it's easy over there um, in most places as long as you don't get too high, um, especially if you look for a variety called ARP, which is named for a town in East Texas where this particular variety was bred. It's quite hardy. And so this plant that you see in the picture it's actually in my front yard. It's been there for years. It's, you know, five degrees outside today. It's been through worse winters than this. You can see a little bit of browning, but for the most part, it's just fine. So you can go out there whenever I need to remember things. I can harvest it up and weave myself a crown of rosemary. After dinner, of course, we'll enjoy some chocolates. Uh, chocolate has been around for a long, long time. Uh, we have evidence that the Aztecs have been drinking hot cocoa for at least 2,000 years. And when you tuck into your Valentine's Day chocolate, keep track and see if you are approaching your annual quota of 11 pounds per person per year, which is how much we Americans typically eat. That is 60 chocolate bars. You know, if you just get a, a chocolate bar at the store, that is 60 of them. I've been trying to rack my brain about when I ate all that chocolate, but I'm um, not going to argue with that statistic. <laughs> um, came from this paper down here at the bottom, uh, Scientific Approach Beyond Myths and Claims to Cocoa, so I trust them. And to make us feel better about 11 pounds of chocolate per year, that's about half of what the Swiss eat. Um, they're packing away actually more than 22 pounds of chocolate per year. That's close to 11 kilos. That's pushing 25 pounds of chocolate a year. Um, there are eight other European nations um, that, on average, their citizens consume more than us. So there's an eating record that Americans do not hold, but 11 pounds is nothing to sneeze at. You might also hear that dark chocolate is good for you. This story comes up on the, in the news frequently, right? Dark chocolate's good for you. Is it good for you? Maybe. Um, as with many things that are made from living things, it's a variable product. Um, it is a good source of anti antioxidants. Um, for most people, it's the third best source after fruits and vegetables. How boring. Um, but studies that show or studies that are used to justify saying that dark chocolate is good for you are typically done on individual components that can be found in the chocolate plant's fruit, not on chocolate itself. And partly that's because chocolate is so variable. Um, just as you see in this box, there's a lot of difference in chocolate, but even in dark chocolate, depends on the uh, variety of cocoa beans that were grown and how it was processed ultimately for what those components might be. So yes, eat your chocolate, it's delicious. Apparently we eat a lot of it anyway, um, but eat your fruits and vegetables too to get those antioxidants. And then after that bouquet and after that dinner, we might have a headache. And so I want to talk to you about willow and aspirin. And so this is probably the, the poster child for plant pharmaceuticals, and it's not without reason. So willows are famous for a few reasons. First, sculpture and basketry. Um, you'll find willow used to make very useful things for humans, baskets and containers, also things like dolls and art, to even to the modern day where you have a few folks, uh, artists who are making monumental sculptures out of woven willow branches. There are some horticultural practices that are used uh, in these day and age um, where you'll see you know, willows cut back to the ground every year, uh, trees that are, are cut back hard to branches called pollarding. Um, those are techniques that were developed in order to create long, straight, thin, flexible pieces of wood that could be then woven. Um, anymore, unless you're running a, a, 
a cottage industry making baskets. There's no reason to do that to willow trees, and it's a lot of work to maintain them that way. But you'll still see um, all over the country that uh, pollarding or cutting back being done to willows and other trees as well. That's perhaps not horticultural best practice, but something that's just we inherited from when we needed long, straight, thin pieces of wood, whether we were weaving baskets or making arrows or whatever, um, before synthetic materials were more commonly available. Uh, it's also famous because of the weeping willow, which is the characteristic scriptural willow um, by the waters of Babylon. Um, and the tree that um, is called the weeping willow, scientific name is Salix babylonica or Babylon willow. Um, that gets argued about by taxonomists all the time and saying, oh, that's not a real species where it is. Um, but certainly there's something characteristically uh, melancholy about a weeping willow. And then finally, um, aspirin. So willow bark has been known to be a treatment for pain and fever and inflammation for a long, long time. You have famous ancient names like Hippocrates, Pliny the Elder, Galen, famous ancient doctor. You have medieval sources like St. Hildegard von Bingen, Henrik Harpestring, um, all of them documented. Yes, willow bark, you've got a headache, if you have aches and pains, definitely use willow bark. And so thank goodness we had Edward Stone come along in the 1760s to discover willow bark. Um, this is sort of another classic Englishism um, where if it wasn't 17, uh, you know, 18th century England, it didn't exist before. And this is an excerpt of the letter that he wrote to the Royal Society talking about how wonderful willow bark was. And I think my favorite, uh, my favorite part of this entire communication is this phrase right here, where um, about six years ago, I accidentally tasted it. And I would just like to see the, imagine the sequence of events that would cause an accidental tasting of willow bark. If you're interested in more plant factoids, um, I would recommend Highly Project Gutenberg and also Google Books, where you know, they've scanned in millions and millions of books, uh, including a lot about plant lore. Um, for example, this one, there are many others, where you can read to your heart's content about plants that you might grow in your garden, plants that you're interested in, plants that we decorate with, and see um, this, this particular book um, is quite good at trying to get a global perspective of uh, documenting every possible folk association with plants. And so now that hopefully you're well and convinced that plants are everywhere, they're a deep part of your life, and that we have deep special relationships with plants, I'm going to provide some reasons to deepen your root and some ways to strengthen your relationship with plants. And the number one reason to do this can't be made clearer than in a quote from a study participant in the United Kingdom. Um, who had a flower pot, essentially, just one pot of flowers placed at the front of their home that previously was just concrete because it will make you feel brighter in yourself. So these are gonna go in order of, of simplicity, in order of uh, ease of, of completing. The first one is just get outside and pay attention. <clears throat> so you might recognize this, the oval, um, and it is one example among many of what we call green infrastructure. Green infrastructure is a newish term that just means public green space, parks, open spaces, natural areas, um, and then even private gardens if you can look into them. All of these public amenities, again, have been shown to reduce stress um, that is measured, measured stress reduction. They reduce perceived stress, which is just uh, self-reported by survey takers as you see, I feel less stressed even though nobody measured cortisol. Um, they increase the cohesion of communities um, and then increasing that nature connectedness, which gets back to all of those things we saw earlier in that slide, ultimately to increase happiness and increase friendliness. So um, with the exception of strong allergies, I can think of no reason that you should not get outside more often. And if you've got strong allergies, um, hopefully you've got an allergy pill that you can take to get out there. Um, if not, maybe the house plants will be more for you. And this isn't just an activity for the summertime either. You know, people say, oh, you know, I can't go see any plants right now because it's January, it's February, and I'm not recommending you run right out today, although if you bundle up, at least here in Colorado, you should be able to do that. But uh, let's look at just a few things from December to now 
Here on December 9th, you can see somebody left these tropical plants outside, or at least that's what it looks like. This is actually a bulb from the Mediterranean that's quite hardy. It's called Aerometallicum. Um, and this was taken outdoors at the Denver Zoo. So it'd be a place um, you can also, you can buy these. Um, larger garden centers might have them. You can certainly purchase them online. You can plant them in your yard, um, zone five or better. And tropical plants will suddenly grow in your yard in the middle of winter. That's because these plants are, are Mediterranean. They're springing up now because at this time of year in their native range, it's sort of rainy and wet and cool, which is ideal for their growth. They're really tolerant of extremely cold temperatures, um, especially if they have a little snow blanket on them. You know, weather like we're getting today might burn them back to the ground, but they'll re-sprout. They're pretty darn tough once they're installed. Um, for a place you could go, uh, not have to pay admission, on December 18th, I visited the Apex Center in Arvada. Um, that's a suburb here of Denver for those of you who have moved far away or never left Fort Collins when you were at school. And this is a rock garden there outside. It's a, a public rec center facility in the city of Arvada. And you can see here in the foreground a manzanita. These are often associated with California. I think the majority of the species of this are native to California, but we have a few that grow here in Colorado quite well. They're one of the few broad-leafed evergreen plants that grow in Colorado um, Really, there's, there's one that grows all the way into the Alpine. A larger one like this um, does better at our elevation a little bit lower. But you can see even on December 18th, something that looks downright summery and cheerful. About a month later in January, I always go out to look for the snowdrops. This is one in my neighborhood in somebody's front yard. This is again a bulb that you would plant in the fall. Oftentimes you'll see these pushing up through snow. And anymore, you'll see, especially in warm days in January, which we often have around here, um, honeybees making cleansing flights. And then when it's warm, they'll go out, stretch the wings and exercise, clean out the hive a bit. And if there are galanthus or snowdrops blooming nearby, they'll visit one for some food. So it's one that you can see, especially if people in your neighborhood have taken up beekeeping. But January 17th, like clockwork, mid-January, you'll see snowdrops. They're completely adapted and tolerant of that extreme cold that you often see um, during January nights, even if we get fairly warm during the day. Another famous early bulb. This one is up on the 1st of February like clockwork for the past four years, which is about how long they've been in the ground. This is in my yard. Um, and you know, everything else, you know, the lawn looks sort of drab and dead and there's dead leaves everywhere. And then suddenly you can see like, like early Easter eggs um, these yellow flowers, beautiful stripes. This is a cultivated variety and you can purchase these at garden centers in the fall, you drop them in the ground and you have something like this on the 1st of February, a warm enough day, you go out there, you look, there they are, your new friends to cheer and warm your heart. And then let's look into the future a bit by looking into the past, uh, March 1st, 2020, just to show you that you don't need to rely on um, things that have been planted deliberately in gardens to be able to appreciate plants that are coming up all the year long. Um, these are some sidewalk weeds. This is Lamium and Plexicoli or Henbit. Sorry, I forgot to type the common name on this slide. Cheerfully flowering, cute little purple flowers um, right along the sidewalk in the public right of way. Would like to point out that it is growing over weed fabric. And as an aside, don't bother with weed fabric. It doesn't work. Use mulch instead. Um, but look at these beautiful, cheerful flowers. And it's one, again, if you stayed there and watched long enough, you'd see bees of all sorts come to visit these. Not only honeybees, but by March, maybe even some of our natives showing up. <laughs> so get outside and pay attention. That's the easiest thing you can do. You can do it if you can't grow houseplants. Um, you can do it if you live in an apartment. You can do it if you live in your own home and have a vast garden. Get out there and look around because there's more happening than you might imagine um, in the world of plants. <laughs> So if you're ready to take the next step beyond just getting outside, plant something and we have your back. And by we, I mean we here at Colorado State University Extension, um, whether it's horticulture specialists, uh, horticulture agents or Colorado master gardeners or master gardeners in wherever, Extension master gardeners in whichever state you live in now. Notice we had a few people from um, neighboring states and even as far as Hawaii there. Uh, you have Extension. It's a national program uh, from land-grant universities in the USDA, and we are help here to help you succeed in growing. So give it a whirl, whether it's going to be a grand space, big or small. Um, this looks like a huge vista. It's actually the size of a residential, pretty standard residential backyard with some borrowed scenery. You know, these trees, 
that you see in the background or over the fence, a um, little sneaky there. And depending on your needs, maybe you don't need a lawn and maybe you would prefer this garden, you know, with a rock path to go down. Or you could have a lot of lawn too. Um, the point is you don't need a huge amount of space to make a grand place. Say you don't have a yard, say you don't want that amount of work. All right, let's look at some containers. They can be inside or outside, grand or small again. So here's a sizable patio with a bunch of containers. Here's a single house plant. Here is a window so full of house plants. These are all options and all of these things, having them around you will confer those physical benefits that we talked about earlier. Um, it, our connection with plants is so deep. Uh, it's not about complete immersion in the natural world. It's just having, you know, I like to call them little friends whenever I go to the nursery. I say new friends. Um, just having them around will, will, improve, will improve your state of being. And maybe you don't have, uh, you know, maybe you've got cats or, or children who knock things over or no windows, no space to grow these things. Uh, maybe all you have is a patchy lawn and some shrubs. All right, the answer for you might not be to plant more plants. The answer for you might be to get creative. Um, so here's an example of some hardscape that was installed in this case a brick pathway. You don't have to use bricks, you could use stepping stones. But imagine this scene without the bricks there, patchy lawn and shrubs. Is it something you're gonna hang around in? No, probably not. Now, there with the, the whimsical path, you know, almost heart-shaped, right, for Valentine's Day, who wouldn't want to take that path? Who couldn't be convinced when you're, you know, talking on your cell phone to somebody or just outside feeling thoughtful to slowly stroll along this meandering path? And without even thinking about it, without being deliberately getting a good dose of being surrounded by our good friends, the plants. And then, especially if you have young people in your life in some capacity, I absolutely encourage you to think about building some kind of special place where memories can be made. That could be something uh, fairly elaborate like this, you know, a canopy gazebo was built, somebody trained vines over it and put tiny furniture in there. You don't need to build a canopy in a gazebo though, you could trim up a shrub. Um, junipers, you know, Fitzer juniper bushes, are famous in our part of the world for being hugely overgrown in front of houses. You know, you can clean out the insides of those and they make a pretty neat clubhouse. So think about ways that you can use plants to make those special places where young people in your life can make some of these and reinforce these deep connections with plants. Because as you see, it's in their best interest that those connections are made. So lastly, I'll point out again, some of those resources that we have uh, CSU Extension, I can't encourage you enough, get to know your local office. We've got resources about horticulture, but about bunches of other stuff, again, from personal finance to STEM, 4-H activities for youth, uh, natural resources, we're all there. Find your county office, get to know the staff. Get to know your uh, Extension Master Gardener volunteers. Uh, if you prefer to stay home or in addition, I encourage you to check out CSU online. We have some certified gardener courses that are running now. There's a house plants course that's about to launch. Um, there are gardening courses throughout the year that you can, uh, you can take online. They're self-paced and filled with information from CSU professors and instructors. Uh, if you're really interested in being certified, I encourage you to look at CSU's Green School, um, which will uh, you can find at certifiedcoloradogardener.org. Um, that is a 12-week course, I believe that at the end will certify you as a Colorado gardener. And then lastly, I absolutely encourage you to visit the cohorts, which stands for Colorado Horticulture, uh, the cohorts blog, whoops, um, at csuhort.blogspot.com or just Google search cohorts blog, you'll find it. Um, there are short articles written by horticulture agents throughout the state, as well as webinars. Um, many of them take place at this time, Friday at lunchtime. Uh, free and open to the public about all sorts of topics related to gardening. So in addition to these alumni association talks, I hope you give it a uh, check out to those uh, Colorado Horticulture webinars as well. Lastly, I'll highlight the Grow and Give Modern Victory Garden Project. This launched last year as part of the um, pandemic response from Extension and the Colorado Master Gardeners in particular. And at that website, growandgivecolorado.org, you can find a huge number of resources to help you grow, particularly vegetables. 
and resources to help you then share your bountiful harvest with your friends, neighbors, or those in need. And if you still need a quote for that Valentine's Day card, I encourage you to steal this one. Um, it's one of my favorite plant quotes of all time, and I'll leave you with it. And thank you very much for attending today and listen to me talk less about gardening, but more about our relationship with plants, which is one of my very favorite topics. Now, if you've got any questions, uh, go ahead and drop them into the chat box or into the Q&A box, and uh, I'll see what I can do. Awesome, thank you so much, John. This is very, very fun. So yes, if you have any questions, we would love for you to include those um, in the chat. John's here for a little bit longer with all of us, so we would love to answer some of those for you. I definitely think the Willow uh, resource was one that surprised me the most today. The Willow history, I guess I should say. <laughs> yeah, that's one, you know, and uh, I forgot to mention on that slide, you know, Willow bark was one that we've used for a long time, and aspirin was only really, uh, the synthetic aspirin was, uh, made twice in the late 1800s and then marketed by Bayer, Mr. Bayer, the Bayer of Bayer aspirin uh, in Germany in I think 1898. So it's only been around for 125 years or so. And before that, if you had a headache, <laughs> then you would go out and grind up some willow bark and, and go that route. So it's interesting to think about, um, you know, we hear about this with rainforest or environmental destruction as well, about think of all the potential pharmaceuticals we're losing and, Yes, that's true. And we got some, it doesn't have to be in the rainforest. Plants are making chemicals no matter where they're growing. And some of them have effects on us. That is super interesting. Um, Beth says, what is that? What is it that makes a plant cold hardy? Is it something about their cell structure? Uh, it depends on the plant, but generally um, for something like the, for like the aromatalicum in particular, um, it is the ability of that plant to modify the concentration of um, soluble particles in the water in its cells. So all plant cells are filled with water, and then that water is filled with sugars, proteins, um, and other molecules. And plants that are growing in areas that temperature swings in and out of freezing, uh, many of them have the capability to cut larger molecules into, small, into smaller ones, um, and uh, thereby lower the freezing point of the water in their cells. Hmm. Plants will also move actively those sugars outside of their cells into spaces within the plant that are in, um, in between the living cells, essentially, so that water can freeze there. Both of those are methods the plant is using to prevent the cell itself from freezing, because plant cells have a cell wall, and if it ruptures, it's curtains. Hmm. And so it's, um, it's about the ability to um, lower that temperature of the water. It's almost super cooling the water. That is very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, Anita is wondering, she said, you mentioned never needing to use weed fabric, only mulch. How deep does the mulch need to be? Sometimes it's so windy in Northern Colorado, it blows away. Yeah, definitely hear you there, Anita. <laughs> Um, you know, we recommend at CSU, uh, Retris has shown three or four inches is the right depth for wood mulch. Um, if you're in a spot, you know, especially east of Fort Collins, yeah, the wind is crazy. Um, consider using pea gravel. For pea gravel, you would only need maybe two inches, two or three inches. Um, if the particle of rock is small enough, and by small enough, I mean half inch or less. So pea gravel, but not, don't get like the big cobble rocks. It's small stuff. Um, that is just as effective as a mulch, as those wood chips at holding moisture into the ground and suppressing weeds. And it actually, um, one potential advantage over wood mulch is that it helps water infiltrate to the soil when we have quick precipitation events like thunderstorms. Hmm. So mulch is great, um, but yeah, if you're dealing with stuff blown away, um, consider pea gravel. Three to four inches is what we recommend though for a depth of, of that wood chip mulch. Um, weed fabric, I shouldn't say never use it. <laughs> weed fabric works really well as a mulch in its own right in places like agricultural production, uh, high volume vegetable production. You can even use it in your own garden. It definitely prevents weeds from coming up. It'll help hold moisture in the soil. 
the practice of using weed fabric beneath wood chip mulch is what really is not needed and in some cases can be detrimental. Um, once you have a layer of mulch over the weed fabric, weed seeds just germinate in the mulch right over the weed fabric. And then even though that fabric is breathable, it's still, especially, and especially as dirt starts to settle into it, can start to actually inhibit water from getting into the soil and it inhibits oxygen from getting into the soil. And that's bad not only for plant roots, but bad for invertebrates as well. So things like earthworms don't like to be under weed fabric because they're suffocating under there or they can once that weed fabric really fills up. The last reason and uh, the dearest to my heart to avoid weed fabric is that it disrupts the life cycle of native bees. So Colorado has about 400 species of wild bees and the majority of those are solitary ground nesting bees and they'll never sting you. They just go around and they dig a burrow, lay their eggs, um, but they can't dig through wheat fabric. They can get mulch if it's not too thick, they can get through gravel, but they will not make it through wheat fabric. So I would say unless you have a really compelling reason in an agricultural setting to be using wheat fabric, save the money, just use mulch. Very interesting. And save the bees and the worms, right? Save the bees and the worms. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We have another question about mulch. Marianne is wondering, does mulch use up the nitrogen in the soil below it? Uh, do we use fertilizer to improve the soil itself? So that's a good question. And it gets to, um, gets to really a lot of soil ecology topics. Um, and <laughs> wood mulch, there's a lot of carbon in wood mulch. Um, and that carbon is really needed by the microbes that live in the soil. Microbes in the soil, um, just like us, they're, they're animal-ish, um, even though they're not technically animals, but um, they need carbon to live. So do we. Plants can make their own carbon. They have all the carbon they need because they just pull it out of the air. We need to find carbon from somewhere else. Microbes love wood mulch, but to break it down, they also need nitrogen. Just like we do. That's protein, right? Nitrogen, protein. So if you have a lot of carbon in your soil, you can really activate the microbes in your soil as long as they have enough nitrogen. Microbes are really good at using up nitrogen if they have enough carbon to justify that need. So yes, if you mix mulch into your soil, you can cause a nitrogen deficiency to your plants because in general, the microbes are better at getting the nitrogen than your plants are. Mulch on the surface of the soil though, does not cause that. Um, there might be a tiny layer right where the mulch reached the soil that nitrogen is lower, but as long as you're not turning that mulch into the soil, you're not going to cause that deficiency. Um, and yes, you could use fertilizer to compensate for microbial use of nitrogen if you, if you were in a situation where, like, say, somebody mixed a bunch of carbon into your soil and you wanted plants to grow. Um, you definitely could compensate uh, for that with a nitrogen fertilizer, organic or inorganic, just take the limitation away from nitrogen. Um, let's see, indoor lime and lemon potted plants, I see as a question. Um, my, so, uh -huh, I have with those personally, I don't think my house is right for them. The, I, can t I can share that from people that have grown them successfully, the keys are light, don't move them around, and they do need seasonality. Mm -hmm. And so they're in your house, if you can put them, you know, in a garage with a window that doesn't freeze. If you don't have that, put them, maybe if you've got an extra bedroom or a room you don't go in that has a window, put them by the window, close the heating vents so that they get cooler temperatures through the winter. Um, that will keep them healthier. With citrus inside, as well as, you know, ficus are famous for that um, as well. Try not to move them around um, because every time you move them, they're going to readjust to their new light level. And they'll do that by dropping a bunch of leaves and making a mess, and making you panic about your plants. So put them in a good spot and leave them there. And then in the summer, if you can, put them outside so that they get as much sunshine and fresh air as they can possibly get. Um, um, let's see, I'll answer Nancy first. What are the plants behind me? They're peonies. Um, they're peonies that last year got smashed in a snowstorm. So they're drooping Aww. romantically instead of standing up straight. Um, yeah, I, the picture turned out great. So I'm pleased with them. It's a great picture. Beth has asked, what are my thoughts on tilling and no dig methods? Um, particularly for vegetable gardens, Beth, I would say um, 
if you can avoid tilling, that is the best for your soil health. Um, so they're great. Um, tilling in agricultural settings is oftentimes necessary to get, at least in you know, modern high volume agriculture, although you'll see no-till is gaining ground everywhere. Particularly in a home garden though, um, if you can avoid disrupting the larger structure of your soil, that is really, really good. Um, so soil, you know, you'll hear like, oh, I've got clay or sand or silt. Um, that's referring essentially to particle size. And then the organic matter in your soil helps those individual particles of clay or sand or silt or some of each stick together into larger aggregates that get called PEDS, P-E-D-S. And the structure of the soil that you can see, you know, when you stick your shovel in the ground, when you have bits of soil, those are PEDS, right? They're not individual clay particles. Those are microscopic. You know what a grain of sand looks like. So you're talking about those larger structures. And it's those larger structures that have the sites where nutrients can sit and that are really active for things like microbial life and invertebrate life and where plant roots can get through. So the less you can disturb your soil structure, the better off you're going to be in the long term in terms of plant health in general. Very helpful. Looks like we've got one more question, John, that we have time for here. Anita is wondering uh, about the importance of slash benefit of our health and planet for eating more plants and less meat. She thought you might mention that. So oh, sure, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> certainly, that's certainly a trendy topic. Um, and I think, you know, I'm not a doctor and I, I'm certainly not a food scientist <laughs> more or in ornamental horticulture. And so I can say, yes, absolutely. That is, that is, I think widely accepted at this point is that eating plants is better. And I can give you um, the ecological perspective on that in terms of energy, at least. And so if, um, if you ever see a food web or a food chain map, you might see something arranged in a pyramid that's called a trophic pyramid um, from the Greek word for trophy, which just means eating. Um, I'm gonna have to look up now the etymology of trophy like you want a trophy because I'm not understanding how I mean. <laughs> that's gotta not be related, but we're gonna find Anyway, a trophic pyramid is about how things uh, eat one another, essentially. And so it'll start with plants and then go to, you know, cows and then lions or people. Essentially, each level of the trophic period, a uh, pyramid, only gets about 10% of the energy from the level below it in terms of energy that it can then use to build its own cells. Um, all the other energy is wasted, if you will. And so if you're eating a cow, um, you are getting a tenth of a tenth of what the plant production was. If you are eating the plants themselves, you're skipping that trophic level. All of that essentially is a fancy way of saying it takes a lot more energy to make a cow and to eat that cow than it does to just eat the plants. And that energy in this day and age is typically, um, at least in large part, coming in the form of fossil fuels. Um, fertilizers, inputs, hard work, you know, sweat equity of farmers, all of those go into that hamburger. And so if you just eat the plants, it's less work, it's less input into the system. And so um, that, that may be maybe a new perspective on why plants, eating plants is better. Again, I'm not a doctor. If you want more information about that, um, I would encourage you to contact the extension office in your county because our food and consumer, uh, food science and family and consumer science agents will have a lot more information than I will. Awesome, that looks like all the questions, John. Um, do you have any final parting plant love words for us? <laughs> uh, you know, get outside, grow some plants. You can't miss. <laughs> Amazing, John, thank you so much. This was super fun, interesting. I think we all have some fun things to bring to our Valentine dates or dinner parties that we may be having in the future. Um, and so on behalf of all of us here, thank you so much for your time today. And thanks everyone for joining in. We hope you continue to stay stalwart, stay healthy and go Rams. Take care, everybody. Oh, lady, it was Napoleon. Napoleon took the violets. <laughs> <laughs> we got a last minute question. <laughs> Bye everybody. <laughs> thanks, everybody, take care. Happy Friday.